Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I believe he is one of the top oil and natural gas experts in the United States. He is the founder and chief investment officer of the oil hedge fund Bison Interest for publicly traded oil and natural gas companies. Josh Young, thank you for joining me again. Great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me back. So, Josh, we're recording this interview on Friday, December 1st, 2023. The West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil price is down back in a trading range to around $74.38. Brent crude's a little bit below 80 at $79.17. I want to get your thoughts, though, on this narrative that I'm seeing from like the oil bears, the hedge fund managers, the global macro hedge fund managers. They're not oil experts like you. They're macro traders. But they had this same type of narrative, I guess, uh, six to eight months ago that we're heading into a recession, demand's going to be destroyed. Do you, uh, do you see evidence that demand is actually collapsing in the oil market right now? Uh, no. Uh, if anything, demand has actually grown a little more than consensus uh, this year. You want to provide some some numbers on that? Because I think we were doing interviews earlier this year, the last couple of interviews, and there was actually some surprising data What in March or April that was coming out that there was a lot of emerging market oil and gasoline and diesel demand growth that was outside of China, right? Yeah. I mean, it looks like we're um, that global demand um, the latest numbers I saw from, I think they were, it was from a Goldman Sachs report where they pulled it from Kepler and Genscape. And I think they have a few others that they cited. Um, I, but I like the investment bank reports cause they'll <laughs> pull all of that and sort of sanitize it. And, um, you know, I wouldn't rely on their price, uh, targets, but it's helpful to sort of get their, uh, processed, uh, sort of com combined data. And um, they were showing about 2.4 million barrel a day demand growth for global petroleum products year over year. So basically, then this narrative that the global macro hedge fund managers that are saying for why, and we're even seeing, I'm even hearing this from some of the supposed oil experts like Rory Johnson. And back in what, Mar February, March, he was super bearish on oil when it was around 67 West Texas intermediate price. And he was predicting an oil crash too. And then OPEC did the cut. So there was just like the narrative is that demand is collapsing, but obviously it sounds like that that's not the case. The other narrative out there is that there's a supply gut, excuse me, is that there's a supply glut here in the United States. I see um, the oil bears that are short oil futures contracts and oil stocks, and they're posting these charts from the EIA that oil production is at a record amount. But is is that number misleading? Is that number that's at a record? Is that all oil? Um, so so they they do break it out, and so you can see how much of that. I, I don't know about sort of specific uh, people, and I, I'd, I'd rather sort of keep this. This sort of uh, general and not about anyone, especially people that might not be <laughs> that aren't here to to respond directly to this. Uh, but um, you know, the EIA does break out sort of what they're showing in terms of liquids, um, and they have made it clear that they were undercounting um, certain natural gas liquids that, uh, like condensate, that that maybe should be included in the oil production stream, and and you can tell because. Um, as their oil production number that they're reporting has increased, their adjustment factor has decreased. That's sort of their error line. And they, they changed what they were doing because the error line was too high. If you have a persistent error of more than two or three percent, um, you're probably <laughs> you're supposed to just be measuring actuals. Um, you're probably uh, doing something wrong. And so, you know, they did set out to try to fix that. Um, but. U.S. production did grow more than I expected, e even accounting for some of these, um, you know, adjustments and data quality issues. Um, and it grew, uh, it grew much more than I expected, and it grew a little more than consensus expectations. And um, I think, I think this is sort of you're even seeing some capitulation of some um, folks that were pretty bullish on oil, along with me. Um, let's say two or three years ago when almost no one was, um, I mean, there, there's very, very few people who I think are, are pretty bullish on oil at this point. Um, and, and I think people are worried because they saw U.S. production grow a lot this year, sort of unexpectedly, and they think they're extrapolating it out next year. 
And the biggest single point that I would point to, um, you know, some analysts from Bloomberg, uh, uh, you know, I've highlighted this on social media and elsewhere, and they were like, oh, well, this is easy. It's going to happen next year. <laughs> Watch it. What, how, what, and, and the easiest thing to point to for why that won't happen is that the U.S. rig count, um, the combined rig count for oil and natural gas, it looks like it's down about 160 rigs year over year after the recent increase in a few net rigs running um, in the U.S. So uh, with a substantial step down in uh, active rigs, along with a dramatic decline, further decline in drilled uncompleted wells, um, it just seems very, oh, and also just minimal actual uh, productivity efficiencies um, net of, you know, uh, wells always get a little less productive over time as core areas are drilled out, and then they get a little more productive from improvements in technology and longer laterals and better, more optimized fracks. And so on balance, um, there's typically small improvements in net productivity and there's not large improvements like many folks are saying or would appear from the data if you exclude um, the unusual completion activity this summer, as well as excluding, um, well, yeah, actually, that would be sort of the big one, as well as excluding the smaller one, which would be the, the decline in drilled uncompleted wells. And the rig count is what already down over 20% since the November 2022 highs. But do you expect that interest rates are finally going to start affecting the oil supply? So for these private shale companies, these shale drillers that are private companies, is the risk-free, quote-unquote, risk-free rate at 5% of money market funds or short-term treasuries, is that going to affect these companies' ability to drill new wells? You know, um, before we get to that, just one, one other factor on supply that's worth mentioning. And I think this is actually something that the oil bears got right. And I think I, I was wrong on, um, which is, uh, Novi Labs put out something on the Bakken recently because the North Dakota, uh, oil, uh, play, uh, surprised to the upside from a supply perspective. And the biggest single contributor to that was actually the restart of old wells um, that had been shut in. And so um, there was this thesis that there were essentially millions of barrels a day essentially behind pipe or that just required sort of adjustments to wells to be able to get more production on in a short amount of time that was going to suppress the oil price. And it turns out that was right. Um, but the reason that that matters so much, again, just focusing on supply um, and, and before getting into the impact of interest rates and other factors, is that a lot of these gains are one-time gains. So you saw the number of wells shut in in North Dakota um, in the Bakken down by 25%, it looks like, over um, the last roughly year or so. And so obviously those wells that were restarted were the ones that were expected to be most productive. Um, and that were also sort of the newest in their sort of hyperbolic decline rate and so uh, or decline path. And so um, they're sort of it's very unlikely that it'll be possible to repeat that sort of gain. And I think that likely was observed across various other shale plays in the U.S. as well as across various oil fields around the world. I think some of the low hanging fruit from that sort of restart process has already been harvested. and. While it's possible there might be some incremental production from further activity along those lines, um, my expectation is that it will be much less efficient and will contribute much less production going forward than it has over the last year. So I think it's important in evaluating these things. Like no one gets all of it right. <laughs> and it's important when you're wrong to accept where you're wrong, to recalibrate, and then to figure out, hey, is this thing that I missed or got wrong um, going to continue? Is it going to be bigger? Is it going to be smaller? And so I think I think these two factors, um, and, and and really just the, these these well restarts as well as this sort of rapid decline in drilled uncompleted wells, both of them just they they mathematically and from an engineering perspective, and also just from an economic perspective, you sort of know this too. They they can't really continue in the same way, and there's a severe limitation in terms of how much more they can go or how much more they can contribute. 
were they using a specific type of enhancing oil recovery, but those wells, they're going to deplete faster, right? So yeah, you said it was a one-off. So they, what, put more capital in with a new type of technology and enhanced oil recovery, and it's a one-off. So they got a, a pop, a restart in production increases, but then the well is going to end up depleting even faster after that? Uh, it, it just depends on the situation. So for these Bakken wells specifically, it looks like there was a combination of refracking as well as just literally restarting old wells probably with uh, uh, acid jobs or other sorts of low intensity, low capital expenditure. Um, and, and and the question is, okay, like why were these wells shut in in the first place? Because you rarely shut in an oil well unless the price of oil is uh, below your cost, your operating cost, excluding your sunk costs for drilling and completing and tying in and so on the well. So um, a lot of these wells were shut in because they were relatively high cost, let's say three years ago with oil at 20 and people were sort of giving up on these things during COVID uh, or, you know, there were several bankruptcy processes in North Dakota. And as a part of that sort of process, um, there's there's going to be, a, um, at least in some cases, you'd imagine the receiver or the administrator would uh, sort of force shut in of anything that was cash flow, even very modestly cash flow negative. So I think I think that's where those wells came from. And so a lot of it, I think, was just restarting relatively high cost wells. And to your point, some of those are going to see really steep declines because you're going to have flush initial production from pressure having built up. And then once that initial production uh, and that pressure falls off, you should probably get back to where you would have been on your decline curve. And many of these were wells that were producing, let's say, 20 barrels a day or 30 barrels a day. In many cases, they were producing a lot of water or had other sorts of issues uh, that would have gotten them shut in in the first place. So, so yeah, I think, I think to a large extent, this sort of flush initial production is not indicative of likely sustained production. And then this effect of restarting wells is unlikely to continue. Um, you know, one company I think you and I talked about a couple different times. I still own stock in it. Uh, Sam Ridge Energy. They they did this in North. Uh, sorry, in uh, Oklahoma, they restarted a bunch of wells that had been shut in, and they were able to um, sustain their production and allow their production to decline only slightly by restarting hundreds of wells with a relatively small production base. Um, and even that had sort of a limit and eventually their production started to decline. And so as a sort of upside case, you can look at sort of what they did and then look at what happened in North Dakota. And, and even from that sort of upside case where you bring on production and it doesn't decline off super fast, um, there's still a limitation to it. You still sort of run out of, I mean, you of course go and turn on the wells you expect to be the biggest and most economic first. And um, when you look across the <laughs> creaming curve, essentially, like what's the most economic and then what's the next mo most economic and so on, uh, you get into pretty marginal stuff pretty fast. And so, um, yeah, I don't I think I think it is important to understand where this stuff came from. And there are some enhanced oil recovery projects. There are some various other things. There's reworks, there's recompletions, there's all kinds of different activities that have happened around the world in different oil fields to get incremental production. and a lot of that, the easy stuff was done. And some of the harder stuff was done, frankly, in uh, 2022, where oil prices got well over 100 and where there were concerns around national security and other non-economic motivations to, to do some of this, um, or where there are expectations of oil prices going even higher and um, you know, there being even more scarcity. And so um, and when you look at the likelihood of those sorts of projects continuing at that pace, um, they seem unlikely. And like I was saying, they're just it's very unlikely there's going to be anywhere close to the same um, quality of those sorts of restart projects in 2024 versus what you had in 2022 after COVID, after whatever, and with just like this in incredible increase in oil prices where I think from the start of the year, oil was at 70. And within a few months, you added oil at 130. So there was just this big impetus to, to engage in that sort of activity. So anyway, I was wrong on the on the projection for uh, U.S. oil production growth this year. And, you know, when I'm wrong on stuff, especially, <laughs> it's fun to look back when you're right and figure out what you did right and what you did wrong. It's a, it's more important when you're wrong to go through and um, look through and, you know, this this drop in rigs. Um, along with 
the easy sort of restart projects and some of the flush production from those restart projects falling off uh, in combination, I, I think I have a pretty high degree of confidence, despite having been wrong this year on the oil production growth trajectory that, that we're going to see much less growth next year. And frankly, we may actually see U.S. production go into decline next year if the rig count doesn't go up substantially from here. And those oil bearers that were right about the supply coming online from the Bakken, they were also telling me in February and March that the oil price was going to $50 or below. And so they were there was piling on to the oil future short. So they were maybe right about one thing, but they were wrong on the price prediction. They missed the oil price rally because there was record shorts for oil futures contracts and they totally missed the rally. So, I mean, they're, they're not going to – I doubt they're going to admit that they were wrong on that. So thank you for, for providing some balanced analysis there. I was actually going to ask you about – production growth. So where the production growth was going to come from in the U.S. and is it actually going to offset these uh, cuts that OPEC and OPEC plus are uh, they're continuing with cuts. So they're maintaining the current cuts and it looks like they're going to do additional cuts as of a couple days ago. But you've been highlighting this at way ahead of everyone else that they've been missing their quotas. So do you think that oil production growth in the U.S. is going to offset OPEC missing their uh, production quotas? Yeah, I mean, it's a funny topic. Uh there was a dispute. It turns out that Angola uh, has said that they are not going to uh, hold themselves to their uh, OPEC quota. And I looked back and Angola has missed their OPEC production quota target for most of the last several years. And so the joke is that, you know, they're mad and they're not going to meet their quota because they're going to miss it again. Um, so some of this stuff and some of the reporting on it is just nonsense. And it's important to remember sort of who is in OPEC and OPEC plus. And um, there is this economic effect, they call it the resource curse, where countries that are blessed with um, abundant natural resources tend to be cursed with um, some of the worst governments, partly because the governments aren't as dependent on their people for revenue. Um, and and then you end up with really sort of messed up um, economic incentives beyond the political aspect and, and with economies that are, are uh, weak and inflationary and have other sorts of issues. And so, um, you know, I think I think it's sort of interesting just to, to note that. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think the U.S. is going to make up for um, I don't think the U.S. is going to make up for uh, OPEC uh, production losses. Frankly, I don't know that OPEC is actually going to experience production losses because if you look at what's happened with Iran, um, their production has increased a lot as the U.S. oddly has not enforced sanctions on Iran and Venezuela. Um, it's a very weird foreign policy uh, of making friends or be treating enemies well and friends poorly. And you know there will be, unfortunately, negative consequences for that. Um, frankly, even for the oil supply where you've seen attacks by Houthis on uh, oil tankers and other uh, cargo ships um, coming uh, to and from the Suez Canal. There's another uh, strait that um, that uh, goes by uh, or that's adjacent to Yemen. And so um, they, they've been uh, hijacking ships or trying to hijack them and um, so anyway, there's there's some negative potential even oil supply, ramifications ironically from that but right now you you've seen um iran grow iran's probably getting close to the point where it's going to be hard for them to grow their oil production much more and actually their exports last month were down a little um but venezuela could potentially grow by another few hundred thousand barrels a day um just as as fields are restarted and as there's sort of more confidence that u.s that u.s leadership will allow um, sanctions either to be broken or provide additional waivers uh, and, and just you know, not enforce the sanctions that are in place, despite the brutal dictatorship that um, you know, is starving their people and treating people horribly and, and sort of is uh, contrary to U.S. foreign policy. So anyway, long answer, but no, I don't think, I don't think the U.S. is going to be able to make up for it. Frankly, if we don't see a much higher rig count in the U.S., we could end up actually seeing U.S. production decline next year. From current levels, and um, you know, I think uh, I think it's worth also mentioning just on the subject of OPEC plus. Um, if you look at the pressure, uh, many, um, I mean, <laughs> there was sort of some nonsense on this uh, OPEC cut where uh, 
you know, if OPEC cut or didn't cut, it was considered bearish by oil bears. And then um, if OPEC cut or didn't cut, it was going to be considered bullish by oil bulls. There, there are sort of good arguments on both sides for, for each of those. Um, but I think the important thing is that the Saudis don't actually seem to be experiencing that much pressure to bring what they called their lollipop sort of additional voluntary million barrel a day production cut back onto the market. And my observation is that you don't see them building inventories from a satellite perspective. And um, you know, if you look at how their fields work and sort of what's been reported around them and what was discussed in Twilight in the Desert, as well as in many other references, and we put out some work on this a couple of years ago, um, you know, I think some of their fields are old and their production is rolling over. And it was actually quite hard for Saudi to produce and export the 12 million barrels a day that they were exporting for a period of time last year. And so I think I think you actually are seeing some production limits in some of the OPEC countries, which drove a willingness to continue to maintain production cuts, um, as is reported in the news. Similar on Russia, um, Russia's production has come in a little higher than consensus, which has been a negative factor for oil. Um, but Russia historically has actually been not that interested in OPEC plus type production cut deals, at least for themselves. And their their willingness to participate in this um in this setup with this additional voluntary cut that they've been holding i think is indicative of their inability to actually supply the full amount that they would have been allowed to if they hadn't done this voluntary cut so i think there's some complexity sort of under the surface and then just some really funny stuff if you actually know what's going on in you know angola and nigeria and some of these other countries that were averse to this um, to this cut. And, you know, it looks like caused some of this uh, drama around this latest meeting where they don't really have the production capability to actually meet or exceed their quotas. Um, but I guess for various reasons, they just like want to think that they could do it. Do you think that most of the OPEC producers are happy with the current oil prices in this trading range? So not too high, not too low, kind of around $75, $80 a barrel? I do not think they are happy with current prices. And I think it's important, and I think you do a good job uh, generally of highlighting the impact of inflation. Um, $75 oil today is like $55 oil 10 years ago. So, and, and that might be generous, right? It might be like $45 oil, depending on how you count the inflation and where you are and well, what you're especially trying to buy. With, and so especially on. interest rates now too, yeah. Sure. Um, but, you know, I mean, in certain countries, there's been way above trend inflation. Like we always think about inflation from a U.S. perspective. But if you think about it from a Turkish perspective, it's what, like been 100 percent year over year inflation or Zimbabwe, thousand percent year over year inflation. Um, so, you know, depending on where you are, um, you may you may be experiencing significant inflation and various Middle Eastern countries, it looks like, have had above trend inflation. And there is just that tendency for natural resources dependent countries to experience above OECD country inflation. And so, um, you know, I think I think for those Middle Eastern countries, there is there's always pressure for oil prices to be higher, to be able to sort of, I guess, feel comfortable and to provide the subsidies, subsidies that they like to provide to their populations. Uh, both direct energy subsidies as well as um, monetary, essentially welfare and make work programs and other things that keep um, certain regimes uh, in control, even with sort of restive populations. So, no, I think I think they're actually probably quite unhappy with current oil prices, and I think they're trying to figure out what they need to do in order to have oil go much higher. And you can sort of see it in what's happened with these various OPEC meetings. Um, in the last year or so, I guess a little more than a year since that October meeting last year, where they've been trying to do different things. They say it's to stabilize and balance the market, but I think what they mean is stabilize it over <laughs> $90 and preferably over $100, but under $130, I think is sort of what they're trying to get to. And I think there's a lot of pressure on them at current prices um, to have higher oil prices. And I don't agree with the many folks that think that OPEC wants to actually maintain market share or produce more. I think there are real production limitations across most of OPEC. I think at this point, what they really want is just much higher prices that aren't 
can, I mean, I think they want less volatility and they've had more and they want higher prices and they've had lower prices. And so I think, I think you, and you can sort of tell from their messaging, you can tell from the conflict in their meetings and you can tell from how they interact with various news agencies and analytics groups and other stuff like that. Yeah, all the commodities producers, miners, oil, natural gas, all those guys are dealing with much higher input costs. You add in higher interest rates that are priced off the 10-year US Treasury, the input costs are trending higher. So maybe like for the six to eight months or something like that, they'll go lower if there is a recession. Some of the input costs will go down. But then, um, you know, if the Fed cuts interest rates or does QE program, the other currencies could devalue more off the dollar. You could have even higher input costs than uh, trending back up. So I think it's just a trend that there's going to be higher price floors going up every couple of years going forward. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think I think we're just we're in a period of suppressed oil prices. Um, and, you know, part of it is this sort of surprise increase in production, both in the U.S. and Iran. Um, part of it is that oil demand is growing despite uh, industrial weakness um, in Germany and China. Um, you know, we sort of had this industrial boom and consumption boom around COVID from the enormous uh, fiscal stimulus, and you know the <laughs> the direct distribution of money to poor people is really good for uh, consumption. And uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we end up seeing more of that. It's a terrible economic policy. Um, but it's like a, sh a sugar rush um, economically. And so I, I think we, we may end up seeing more of that um, coming into this next uh, election year in the U.S. and then in various other countries where there's um, a lot of pressure on their leadership, like in Canada, uh, with a potential election coming up in the next couple of years, um, as well as various European countries where, where they're really struggling with sort of lower industrial activity levels. Anyway, with what the remarkable thing for demand is that um, you had this industrial downturn, you had this real estate development downturn in China that the bears were expecting, and you still had like 400,000 barrels a day more demand growth than the IEA and EIA were projecting. I think it's even more than, than OPEC was projecting for this year if you go back to to last year's projections for this year. So, so and demand is outside of, from, is that outside of China? So even though China has not come back online, so that demand growth is coming what from emerging markets outside China. So like India, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, uh, Asia. Uh, sort of no. I, you, you're actually seeing China did come back on. It's not fully back on, but what what you're seeing is that China's industrial and construction related oil demand is down, uh, but China's consumption related. And just sort of general demographic related oil demand is up. And, mm -hmm. and so you're seeing it's sort of um, the right way to think about it. Um, you know, Vaclav Smil and Alex Epstein and various others have, have put out these different charts and you can see it in our, our world and data and whatever, um, where, where you see uh, the amount of energy consumption in the U.S. and in other uh, you know, Western countries versus in Africa or various other places. And you know, if you look at the amount of oil the average Chinese person uses versus the amount of oil the average American person person uses, I think it's still five to one or ten to one as much oil uh, being used in the U.S. versus China. And so, even without substantial positive GDP growth, you can still end up seeing increases in oil consumption, and then maybe you just see a decrease in um, construction activity, <laughs> or you see a decrease in the value of a house or value of whatever other stuff is being sold or fewer TVs bought or various other, you know, there's, there's very, and I'm, I'm well, sort of simplifying this and using tangible examples, but I think, I think it's possible to see negative headline GDP numbers, see a terrible downturn in certain aspects of an economy and actually still see year over year total oil demand, uh, growth just again, but it's almost like a buoy effect. Well, tra transportation, transportation fuels. So like gasoline and diesel, I mean, the initial switch. So if people go and look up pictures or videos from emerging market cities in major cities, so like Vietnam or some of these other countries, 15, 20 years ago, there was a lot of people on bicycles. There wasn't as many motorcycles, scooters, uh, small cars. Uh, the transition, now a lot of people are not walking places, not using as many bicycles or taking the bus. So they're consuming a lot more gasoline and diesel in small amounts, but the total amount of people is adding up. Um, yeah, that's right. There, there's, there's more people in some countries, but even in China, where 
it looks like the population may have either peaked or is peaking very soon. Um, you're still, you know, you just, if you have hundreds of millions of people in uh, rural areas, um, you know, there's still, um, there's still very little oil that those people are using. And then they have kids that, or a kid that may travel home um, to see them. And maybe they travel a little more, or maybe they buy their parents a gas powered scooter or various other things. Um, and then, you know, a big part of the bearish uh, oil story for this year was that electric vehicle consumption was up enormously last year on a percent basis, especially in China. And the, the adoption rate has actually slowed substantially. And so if you had sort of straight lined the almost 100 percent year over year percent growth in electric vehicles to this year, you, you would have really started to actually hurt um hurt the trajectory of oil consumption growth in China. And that would have also been true in various other markets where it was slower, but still continuing. And actually what it looks like is happening is that you're getting to a saturation point where um, you know, at, at, in the current form and at the current cost, there's a limited portion of the population that can either afford or really wants to use electric vehicles. And you're getting to a point where you're you're hitting that wall. Um, which is pushing electric vehicle prices down, but also pushing their sales um, not not down year over year, but uh, growing way less fast than than consensus uh, expected, or than sort of I guess the kludgy straight lining forecasts um, had shown. So, well, um, Elon Musk even said that interest rates are affecting buyers, so the cost of auto loans. So he even said that uh, in the last couple of months. Yeah, but you know, I think I think you want to take any of that with a grain of salt. Um, you started seeing this slowdown in electric vehicle consumption, um, even at lower interest rates. <laughs> and so I don't think I don't think it's because people can't finance cars. And frankly, you know, home builders are doing fine financing homes they build by just buying down the rates for uh, buyers of their homes. So if you have a high margin on your on your vehicles, you you can provide below market financing. I think the problem that Tesla is running into, along with others, um, and full disclosure, I, I own some small number of put options as part of a basket on Tesla stocks, and I'm not recommending that. But um, I think what Tesla and other electric vehicle manufacturers are running into is um, more of this uh, demand saturation, and um, you're, you're also seeing this interesting re-up effect where a number of people that bought an electric vehicle aren't buying an electric vehicle as a replacement. And so <laughs> it's it's not um it's not zero percent, but it's also not the hundred percent that I think many were assuming would happen. And you know, there are just some there's some difficult realities associated with um with electric vehicle uh use that I think limits the demand, especially in the current state where where you have limited charge availability in certain places and um, various other factors that I think are are cutting into demand. So I actually don't think that that's interest rate driven. I think we are at a point in the economic cycle where we're starting to see slowing consumption on discretionary large purchases of stuff like cars. Um, but if you look at the change in electric vehicle mix. I think that actually is more indicative and you're not seeing the acceleration despite giant expenditures and subsidies and so on by the U.S. and other governments to try to push electric vehicles. You're just actually you're seeing very disappointing numbers from the perspective of electric vehicle manufacturers as well as policymakers that want more electric vehicles to be consumed and fewer um, gasoline and diesel power vehicles to be consumed and used. And so that's that's been incrementally bullish for oil demand, both for this year as well as uh, looking out. And and it's actually, I think, breaking some of these forecasts from some of the energy consultancies and some of the um, uh, the IEAs of the world and so on, where you look at some of their forecasts and then you look at the actual trend, the current trend for electric vehicle sales and adoption. And uh, they, they they took some numbers from. Uh, accelerated consumption periods of time like last year and sort of relied on on that continuation, which has not happened. So so I think I think you're going to see some significant upwards demand revisions for oil. And I think you could end up seeing 
a much higher um, peak oil demand number globally than most are are projecting. Are you getting like five page emails from like ESG consultants and people at think tanks and uh, people at like McKinsey and Booz Allen Hamilton and uh, other ESG think tanks telling you like how you're wrong and listing all the data points and saying that like wind and solar and electric vehicles have positive return on investment and that you made it up that there's no losses or bad investments in uh, ESG? <laughs> um, you know, I get I get lots of emails. Mostly emails I get that look like that are actually just phishing emails where they're trying to hack my computer or phone or whatever. So I, I'm pretty careful about what I open these days. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe you should be careful if it requires clicking on a link to find out something like that. Definitely don't click on it. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I think I think some of that narrative has blown up. Uh, I actually as a Part of that sort of left tail basket, I owned some puts on uh, a clean tech index um, that actually those puts did very well this year, uh, and I sold most of them. And uh, you know that that was a, a nice a nice hedging win. Um, but if you look at if you look at the equities, uh, those have collapsed. So that reminds me a little of some of these venture firms and other tech firms that were making sort of wild claims despite tech stocks crashing last year. And then even with the rebound this year, I think I saw in the news, uh, Tiger Global uh, wrote down the marks on their venture investments by an additional 18%, I think it was, uh, for Q3. I think that was a Bloomberg headline. I don't remember exactly where or that exact number, but I think it was directionally around that sort of just under 20% number. Um, so, you know, obviously, <laughs> if people are saying there have been no losses, uh, that's just not true. Uh, it's been it's been very rough for new businesses of a variety of sorts, especially some of the uh, the sort of uh, ostensible clean tech businesses in the last few years. Well, there's been government sponsored pump and dumps with the government spending and the insiders that are friends and family members of the Department of Energy and others. There was even a Wall Street Journal article covering all this stuff back in February where the ethics lawyers inside the Department of Energy were warning about all the insider trading going on, saying we're not filing criminal charges and wagging their fingers at this stuff. But like there's just countless examples of like the insiders that made a million bucks or more on some of these green energy companies and they cashed out and then the shares crashed. But I had an ESG lobbyist uh, or think tank person like harass me in the last week. And he was telling me I, I can't provide a single thing of evidence that there's any losses for any of these green energy, electric vehicle or ESG companies. Just look at um, the Siemens in Germany. They had a the German government had to bail out both divisions of Siemens for the wind and solar. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you can also look at Solyndra where there were major uh, Democratic Party donors. And I think someone who was like a super fundraiser, I forget the name for it, but uh, who helped get Obama elected and then got a giant uh, loan for Solyndra that the government apparently, there, there was a lot of reporting on this. They sort of expected a loss, but they did an interest-free loan anyway, and then it lost money and, you know, uh, there were there was no recourse. So you know, I, think, I think one of the challenges there is that some of the reporting that's done, and I still don't know how this is legal, and I don't really understand why there aren't giant disclaimers at the bottom of every article from basically uh, at least two of the major news agencies are affiliated with large ESG consulting groups. And so I just don't understand if they're going to have these sort of uh, climate catastrophe articles or make claims around um, lack of losses in private businesses that are hard to value in the midst of broadly private businesses of that sort having significant write downs and public equities having significant write downs. I just don't understand how they don't have those sorts of disclaimers. And I understand why they're not disclaiming it and why they're not sharing it, which is that I think if people understood that these news articles were in many cases, essentially advertisements <laughs> for the um this this ESG or whatever other consulting that these affiliates of these news agencies were providing, I think they would treat it differently. Um, and then I think there's also this other aspect of it that's really ugly, which is that there's sort of a carrot and stick aspect where if you look at the reporting on certain companies versus other companies and you look at the ESG ratings of certain companies versus other companies, it seems divorced from 
the actual environmental, social, and governance impact or the actual uh if if you were coming from Mars and you were saying, okay, like what what is good for the environment? What does it mean to like treat people well? What does it mean to have a well-governed business? Um, you know, you have companies that have high scores that are high paying clients of these groups. Um, and then you have these uh hit pieces and very negative articles and stuff on companies that are not clients of those groups. And, um, you know, I think, I think there's just, it's unfortunate sort of the direction that that sort of, uh, coverage has taken. And so it's not surprising well, that you would have gotten some of that feedback. Well, also there's the bylaws that were changed over the last 10 years for a lot of these, what pension funds, institutional investors, even bank loans that they can't loan money to a lot of non ESG energy companies. So coal, oil, natural gas, liquefied natural gas, uranium mining, a lot of these firms, they had bylaws in place where they couldn't make investments in these. Do you expect those laws to be changed? Because didn't, didn't we just see BlackRock say that they're going to have to abandon ESG investment? The losses are too much. The public backlash is too much. And they want to start um, diversifying into non-ESG energy investments now. Um, so I think that came out in the context of uh, the state of Texas and maybe a couple of other states sort of pushing on um, divesting from and sort of avoiding doing business with groups that were that were doing this. And so, you know, it was one of those really sort of, um, uh, I think, reprehensible practices where you say one thing to one group of people and then go and say the opposite to a different group. And so I don't know that there's been any real changes. I haven't seen any real changes. Um, and, and then, you know, BlackRock, I, I believe, and, and some others, um, made claims that they had never divested and they pointed to ownership of oil and gas stocks. But a lot of that ownership was in ETF and index fund products where it wasn't discretionary on their part. It was just their their deal was to provide this these ETFs or index funds that would include these um these uh, equities. So um, anyway, I don't know. I don't. I don't think there have been any real changes that I've seen uh, in, in that were favorable towards investment in oil and gas. And I think it's one of those things where um, the the longer and more ridiculous, uh, the longer this lasted, and the more ridiculous the divestment uh, activities were, the more likely it was that you were going to end up with a significant uh, deficit in supply. And I think what happened last year is that that narrative got taken maybe to a little bit of an extreme. And while it's still true, while there's still gross underinvestment overall in the industry in terms of exploration and delineation, um, there's still, there were enough projects to do to go develop oil or turn on old wells that you know were very short cycle, not very sustainable, um, but there was enough to obviously bring on some additional production in the U.S. this year. So I think it's less about, hey, this is happening right this second and more there's a likely cascading impact of underinvestment. And on a multi-year basis, you should expect significantly lower production um, than you would have had otherwise through um, uneconomic underinvestment. And so, you know, again, like you can see it with uh, shale where you're starting to see more and more tier two and tier three shale wells drilled, which maybe come on at similar production rates, but have much, much higher uh, decline rates. So much less sustainable production. Um, and then, you know, higher gas percentage and higher water, which requires more reinjection and has an environmental impact as well as having um, worse economics. And so I think it's uh, th these divestitures matter but maybe they didn't matter as much as many thought over the short term, but maybe they matter even more than everyone thought over the medium to long term. Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of capex that needs to be invested to maintain the current supply levels. I've seen estimates that there needs to be five trillion total invested by 2030 just to maintain the current sub, uh, annual global supply uh, production levels. So, uh, do you think that that's a reasonable estimate, or do you think that's way too high? Um, I mean, across commodities, probably just for oil, maybe that's a little high. Um, I mean, it's, it's, that's a little hard to say. Um, you, I, I'd say there probably needs to be an additional, let's say, four or $500 billion a year for oil. Um, 
in, in CapEx. So, so yeah, uh, you know, it's a little, it's a little high, but not, not crazy high. Um, and like one of the problems is that there's been this underinvestment in oil field services, which people haven't really been talking about. We put out a white paper on this a year ago, and uh, it's funny, everyone was talking about that shortly after we did that, and then it sort of disappeared. So maybe we should put out another white paper, and then, you know, various uh, uh, energy news uh, sources can can do their own independent research and publish it without citing us. Um, and so, you know, um, I, there there's this problem with with not building new offshore drilling rigs and with not um, not even investing to sustain the ones that were built 20 or 30 years ago that were in operation 10 years ago, where you're likely to end up with significantly reduced capacity. And what you saw last year was when everyone wanted to sort of race to try to get more production on, what you ended up with was more production in <laughs> North Dakota from reactivating small old wells and you didn't end up with, um, you know, a ton more offshore wells drilled and completed and online, of course, because those take years. Um, but it's worth highlighting that you just didn't, you, you had the start of this process, but even when you look at how many more rigs can get brought on and how many more exist, um, you know, there's just, there's just not that many, not that many more. So I think there's a good argument that you're going to need actually to see new offshore drilling rigs built and new supply boats built and maybe even new onshore drilling rigs built. And, and that means um, years of higher day rates and good margins for these oil field services businesses such that they feel comfortable investing in new equipment. And that sort of pushes um, the timeline on potential adequate or oversupply for the market in the medium to long term it pushes that timeline back even more. So, you know, if you look at the um, oil bull market from 2001 to 2014, almost every year <laughs> for the first five years or so of that bull market, you had similar sorts of pushback as you're seeing now where people said, oh, you know, now oil's up a little, you're going to see tons more oil production and the bull market's over. And you would see oil prices as, as those sorts of narratives catch, would catch on. You'd see oil prices pull back. You'd see the oil stocks fall. You'd see uh, divestment and various other, you know, they would just sort of catch on repeatedly. And then you'd see higher prices as supply would be insufficient on a multi-year basis. And even with inventories actually not falling that much um, at times and even growing substantially at times, you'd actually see oil prices rise materially over that time frame. And so um, I think I think we're seeing a similar dynamic. And I think when, when you look at who's still active in the industry and sort of who was around in the early 2000s, and frankly, I only started investing professionally uh, in the space uh, shortly before uh, the financial crisis around 2007. Um, but <laughs> when I started, I could look back at that period of time prior and sort of see what had happened and so on. Um, even People with that amount of experience as, as I have from that sort of 2007, 2007 time frame and seeing sort of what happened after that, um, most of the folks that are around that are sort of more seasoned uh, are looking back at sort of the 2012 to 2014 time frame and are sort of gearing what a bull market looks like off of that. But that wasn't really a bull market. That was the very end of it um, and, and was sort of the early stages of a collapse. And what we're experiencing now has very little in my assessment to do with that and much more to do with um, what you saw in 2002 and 2003 and so on, where you, know, you, you had similar situations like this, where you had demand surprising up, you had supply surprising up also. Um, again, like it wasn't, you actually didn't see large inventory declines in that time, even with significant oil uh, price increases. Um, but what you did see was the inability to bring on sufficient production to actually um, oversupply the market and push prices down. And similarly, you know, with the amount of demand growth that we experienced this year and with the trajectory we're on for demand for next year. And again, I don't think anyone really knows. And there's a lot of risk around the economy and so on globally. But, um, you know, with with these elections and with some of the other fiscal policies going on in the U.S. and prospective stimulus and fiscal uh, ease in China and Germany and various other places, I, th I think you actually could see it look very similar 
to what the oil dynamic looked like in the early 2000s with much higher oil prices, much higher activity, and still insufficient supply due to some of these constraints. So again, <laughs> I guess this got, comes back well, to divestment and uh, capital spend, and you just you need oil field service capex, and you can't have that until you're, I think, a couple more years into the cycle. Well, I see oil in a trading range. So for the different factors, there's conflicting factors kind of in a tug of war. So OPEC clearly wants higher prices because they, with inflation, they want to balance their budgets. They have higher costs going up, trending upwards with input costs. But where interest rates are, I just uh, I just don't see the incentive, especially if oil prices go to a lo little bit lower. I don't see the incentive to bring on an, a lot of new supply. And there's not the easy shale boom oil that there was from what? 2009 to 2014 or 15, it, the capital is not available. There's not the easy tier one acreage for production growth. So I, I think we're kind of back towards 2007, where any future oil production growth is not going to come from insane amounts of shale oil growth. Yeah, well, I, I think I agree with that. I think there are places we're going to see oil production like Guyana, um, but there's also places we're going to see oil uh, production uh, declines or uh, disappointments. And so, um, you know, a as that plays out, I think I agree. I don't know about the trading range, though. I think, I mean, like we talked about at the start of this, I think I think you've seen sort of general capitulation, you've seen oil bulls uh, sort of uh, giving up, and you've seen oil bears declaring victory, even though, um, you know, prices aren't as high as oil bulls thought they would be for this year, but they're not nearly as low as oil bears thought. Um, so, so you're sort of, a, it should be like a, a wash that, oil stocks are down a little. Uh, that sounds like I'm, a range, Josh, like 75 <laughs> is where both sides are pissed off. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And that's what's happened. But what I'm saying is, let's say we're talking two years from now, three years from now, absent a horrible global economic catastrophe. Um, and even if there is one, as long as there's then massive stimulus to sort of print the way out from that, um, I think you see much higher oil prices from the dynamics that we're describing. So yeah, we've experienced this trading range this year. And since, uh, you know, essentially Q4 last year. Um, but I think, I think what we see, you know, I, hard to say in the very short term, but I think what we see as US production disappoints, as you need way more rigs running just to keep production flat, in the U.S., as you see demand continuing to grow absent a deep recession, um, I think I think we're set up for much higher oil prices. And you know, I think the oil equities reflect people's very negative sentiment, and you know, positioning is very negative. Uh, the short interest in the sector is the highest that it's been. Essentially, uh, I saw a chart from uh, Goldman: the the net positioning is the lowest. Um, that it's been essentially since uh, the COVID era. So um, it's, it's set up very nicely, I think, with many, many people giving up, sad, upset, bragging about having sold all their small oil stocks, complaining about not being in, quote unquote, safe, large companies, and really just complaining about not owning tech. And um, <laughs> to me, that has uh, shades of you know, November 2020 or so, where everyone hated it, no one wanted it, positioning was really low, and yet the fundamentals were actually really promising. Not looking backwards, obviously, if you look back to November 2020, things looked terrible in the rearview mirror, but looking forward, things looked really good. And so I think it's sort of a similar setup. Maybe there is not the same upside from 40 to 130 as there is from you know, 75 here, but I think similar sort of idea with significant potential upside um, and a lot of things that would have to go wrong, like you pointed out, for oil to go down much more than where it is right now. Well, if it goes down too much, I mean, the supply is uneconomic. So you're going to see a lot of supply come offline very, very quickly, especially with interest rates at these levels. Uh, I think a lot of the producers, the mid-tier ones or the independents, the ones that have good free cash flow still, they're looking at acquisitions, mergers. Uh, we just had really big ones from Chevron and ExxonMobil. We'll see how those play out. So I think there's going to be more mergers and acquisitions because cost of capital for a lot of the smaller companies is very high, especially for the private ones with the the interest rates. And, and there's no global supply glut. I think that's the main thing because I hear the bears say supply glut, supply glut, uh, record oil production. Well, maybe like the oil inventories in the US are somewhat high, but globally, I don't think that that's the case at all with a global supply glut. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's it is interesting. Like the the narrative 
and the headlines around oil have been very uh, disconnected from the actual supply demand supply demand dynamics. And I think what we're seeing is where there was this consensus two plus million barrel a day uh, deficit for the second half of this year. We're seeing a deficit that's closer to let's say a few hundred thousand barrels a day. And again, that's even with Iran up a lot, even with shale having this sort of shorter term boost from all the completions that were going into this winter. Um, and that's with Libya with sort of near record high production for the last few years on. That's with various other countries that have had production issues sort of at their relatively high sustainable production levels. Um, and, and again, that's after a lot of the same sorts of restarts like we talked about in North Dakota happening across the U.S., across Canada, and frankly, around the world. And so even with all of that, you're still in a slightly undersupplied market. And I think that's a really good setup um, as, as some of that production starts to come off, but you still see substantial demand growth. And then, you know, you see these narratives about uh, demand peaking or demand struggling. And then you see headlines like the, the U.S. experienced the highest number of, um, of uh, uh, passengers in the air any, uh, uh, for a day. I think it was uh, last week. It was around Thanksgiving. Um, so, you know, you, you, see, you see indications of demand that are really promising um, and demand growth that are promising, even from places like the U.S. where you wouldn't be expecting that sort of demand growth. And then just one comment on that. Um, it's, it's always interesting to see people seem to forget that jet fuel is an oil product too. And so you have some oil bears or just sort of oil market commenters talking about how terrible U.S., let's say, gasoline demand is, uh, ignoring that an additional, I think it was two or 300,000 more people flew this Thanksgiving than last Thanksgiving. And, and you know, ge general uh, air travel demand is up quite a bit. Jet fuel demand in the U.S. is up quite a bit. And that is offsetting some gasoline demand where some of the folks that were flying this year drove last year. And so I think it's important when you when you think about this to, to think about sort of aggregate demand and aggregate U.S. demand is actually quite healthy, again, despite some of these negative headlines. And so, you know, I think it's, uh, it's sort of one of these weird things to say because you can see the global inventories <laughs> from various uh, folks that, that do this for a living and that... Um, you know, their data is uh, decent in aggregate. And then you see these uh, headlines that are just gloom and doom, and you see the oil price low, but then you also see the net positioning extremely low, both on the equities and on the commodities. I don't know. I think it. I think it's like a really, I'd rather be in a situation where the de supply demand is good and getting better, and where the sentiment is terrible and the positioning is awful than the other way around. And I think we're, we're set up really nicely for an eventual substantial move higher, both in the commodities and in the equities. So if you were running an oil and natural gas company right now, and you had good free cash flow, good profit margins, would you be looking at acquisitions right now because valuations are cheap and hated? So I don't think there's a right answer, the a right generic answer. There are companies that I'm invested in that have high debt levels that should be taking their free cash flow and paying off expensive debt. There are others that have very heavily discounted share prices that are doing buybacks that should be buying back even more stock. There are others that are acquisitive that have done really good acquisitions that they've integrated very effectively that should be buying assets to the extent that they can highly creatively finance them. Um, and then there are some that have really great drilling prospects that should be drilling them and uh, and generating high returns and growing. And so it just depends on on what the DNA of the company is, what the assets of the business are, and what's available in the market around them, as well as in the stock market and in their their own capital structure. So I think it really is company dependent, but I'd say in aggregate, the industry's probably been spending, and I know I just said that I think the industry's underspending relative to the supply that's going to be needed in the next few years. But for right now, if you look across the industry, valuations are very low. And there's great opportunities in paying down debt and buying back stock that um, on aggregate, and again, not there, there, there are exceptions and every company is different. But in aggregate, I think the sector would be doing a lot better if more capital was being spent on buying back shares rather than 
some of these larger high priced acquisitions or um you know uh overspending to grow short cycle shale production that's very interesting because cost of capital for a company like ExxonMobil or Chevron is relatively cheaper compared to some of these other companies. So like a lot of, we didn't get to discuss interest rates. So, so these private shell drilling companies, I mean, their cost of capital with the interest rates where they are is going to be very high. A lot of these SEC accredited investors or smaller funds, they're probably going to want to just buy short-term U.S. treasuries or money market funds for a risk-free 5% instead of drilling off a lot of new riskier high-cost shale wells. Um, yeah, I think I think there's pressure on that. But the flip side is that if you can go put together some inventory and drill 100% rate of return wells, that's, that's obviously far superior, even on a risk adjusted basis to earning four and a half percent or something on your uh, two year bonds. So I think uh, I think it really depends on the situation and depends on what's available. And um, you know, I think the the reality is that um, there's too much money being spent on low return projects and there's not enough money being spent on high return projects. And so when you have that sort of situation from an industry perspective, the general answer is to return capital. And, and even for the Exxons and Chevrons of the world, look, like I don't think it was such a great deal for Exxon to go buy Pioneer. And I don't think I think it's a little more complicated, but I also don't think it's such a great deal for Chevron to be buying Hess, especially with potential, and then maybe they'll have an out on this deal if this happens in low probability, but worth highlighting. Um, you know, Venezuela is having a vote soon about potentially trying to expropriate half of Guyana, including almost all of the offshore blocks. And you know, we'll see if the US government suddenly starts to care about Venezuela being a militant dictatorship that mistreats their own people and maybe also wants to invade their neighbors. Um, again, low probability, but worth highlighting. But like, do you really want to go spend tens of billions of dollars and pay a high current cash flow multiple to buy oil in the ground offshore um, in a jurisdiction where it's a small country that is at risk of uh, expropriation by a country that's sanctioned um, or uh, potentially could be <laughs> invaded by that sanctioned country. And so um, you know, I think I think these are maybe not the best places to allocate capital. And frankly, even at their current valuations, I think Exxon and Chevron might have been better off just buying back stock rather than doing these big deals. Secondarily, at lower sizes, which it's really odd, but for various reasons, large companies feel like they're sort of too good for buying smaller assets. But if you look at the size range down, I was just chatting with a, a energy re reporter about this. Um, the, if you look at the like $500 million deals in the Permian, they seem to be getting done at like two and a half or three times cash flow. And then you look at the uh, $5 billion deals or $10 billion deals, and they seem to be getting done at seven times cash flow. You know, you'd think if you're an Exxon or Chevron or whatever, and this isn't about any particular company, but if you're any of them, why wouldn't you just go in and pay three and a half times cash flow and buy all of the $500 million deals? And even if you had to pay four times instead of paying seven times, uh, and, and there are asset specific arguments on these things, but it, in general, it works out to me that they just don't want to do the work of these sort of smaller deals and they're worried about the optics. But if you just look purely from a return on invested capital, return on equity perspective, there's much higher returns paying lower cash flow multiples. Even if you're getting a little less inventory or it's a little lower return inventory, you're still the returns are just so much higher on these sort of smaller deals. So uh, again, I think the larger generally Josh, the larger companies, whether it's ExxonMobil or in gold mining, like Barrick Gold and Newmont Mining, they don't run those metrics. Like you said, I know you're big on that stuff and you're, you were a traditional value investor before you went into oil and gas. So like the, the gold mining industry, the larger companies, they wrote off over $70 billion in bad deals. They were all going after really large deals with the headline. So it's to make a splash. So they don't mind if they're overpaying because they're going for like a big headline splash. But yeah, I agree. That's like, they're not paying attention to the numbers and the metrics for evaluations. Yeah. And, and one of the things that's super interesting, you can see this, there's a roll up. There's a number of roll ups going on, but there's one that looks like it's working. I don't own the stock because it's been relatively expensive versus other similar companies, but they're doing a good job 
in terms of getting assets to get bigger. Uh, if you watch Permian Resources, they just bought Earthstone, which was another smaller publicly traded oil and gas company in a stock for stock deal. And you can see them as they've gone from essentially a billion dollar company to now a $10 billion market cap. Um, and you can see their multiple starting to expand. And frankly, um, I'd argue that maybe their assets are a little inferior to certain other companies that I own stock in and others that I don't. Um, but it sort of doesn't matter because as they're getting bigger, their valuation multiple is expanding. And I think what you're saying is sort of true in the sense that now they're at a $10 billion market cap and they're bigger. Maybe they'll go do another couple deals and then maybe Exxon or Chevron or whatever can go buy them. And they wouldn't go and buy all the deals that Permian Resources was buying at three times cash flow or that Vital, which I own, is buying at two and a half times cash flow or that uh, Civitas is buying at three and a half times cash flow, whatever. Right? They're not buying any of those deals, uh, but then they'll go and <laughs> overpay and pay a one and a half times multiple premium to get the aggregate company once it's bigger. And so what, what I was saying wasn't that I expect them to do that. Um, because I agree, they're just there's not sort of how they're built. But I think that's a mistake. And given the size of the organizations and the theoretical management ability, capability to either do it themselves or build out an organization to do it, there's so much money that's left on the table through that inefficiency of being unwilling to buy much cheaper deals that are cheaper because they're smaller. Um, you know, it's money that's, like you said, left on the table for uh, investors like me that are willing to go to these smaller companies, um, because over time, there is that potential for appreciation and companies that trade at two and a half or three times or whatever cash flow can pay down debt, buy back stock, do other things that can disproportionately reward their shareholders versus companies at seven or eight or 10 times cash flow. But, um, you know, they're they're not doing it like you said, and they're not doing it. I think because they they choose not to, even though they should. And getting back to the question of hey, what should oil and gas companies do? <laughs> I'd argue the generic answer probably is just pay down debt and buy back stock and slow down drilling and slow down acquisitions. And then companies that can do highly accretive acquisitions and highly strategic acquisitions should be doing that because, like you said, valuations are very. And that will restrict supply and then we'll have a rally in oil prices. And I don't know if it's six months or eight months or 12 months, but it'll be a substantial rally. So maybe in the short term, it goes down a little bit to a bottom of a trading range. And then, but if that happens, like you said, it'll play out and then we'll have a restriction, a further restriction of supply in the private sector and maybe OPEC, more OPEC cuts and then a rally. Yeah. I mean, I, just because I'm saying it doesn't mean they're going to do it, but I think, well, I yeah, think we, I mean, these guys are not a, they, they're not all rational players and thinking clearly and running the valuation metrics like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think I think we'll see much higher prices sort of no matter what. This was less about how to engineer high prices. High prices are coming because the world has underspent by probably a couple trillion dollars of exploration and delineation that takes years and is going to require a lot of spending on oil field services capacity. Um, so <laughs> it's going to happen sort of no matter what. Uh, in the meantime, the question is, okay, so you're a board member at XYZ oil company. What do you, what do you tell the CEO when he says, Hey, we're going to go drill baby drill, or we're going to go do this really expensive acquisition or we're going to whatever, like what, what should you want? Or you're that CEO and you're listening to this, Hey, like what, what should I do? Like what's going to work? And, you know, I think too many companies have these great big aspirations and too few look at these wonderful successes of businesses that pay down debt, buy back stock and are very, very careful with their capital um, and, you know, Charlie Munger just passed away and, you know, lived an amazing life. And one of the, the greatest things that Munger did was sharing um, what he had learned that helped him become a billionaire as an investor. And one of the things he learned was that companies that retire a large portion of their overall share count while sustaining their business, but not necessarily growing a whole lot and actually in some cases shrinking, they could end up being phenomenal investments. He called them share cannibals. And so I think maybe oil prices would be higher if there were more share cannibals in oil and gas, but there certainly would be uh, much happier <laughs> shareholders and uh, much higher returns uh, from owning oil and gas public equities if more companies were oriented towards that. So I think that's the, uh, even at current valuations sort of across the sector, uh, even at the the valuations that some of the oil majors are trading at, I think I think the answer is probably on for any given situation, 
uh, most likely it's just to pay down debt and buy back some. And I'm in the David Einhorn camp for value investors where like the way taxes on dividends are heading, it's just more tax efficient for a lot of these uh, companies in different countries to start buying back stock because then they don't have to, the dividend taxes are triple tax by the time they get to the shareholders. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, there's, there's differences in buybacks versus dividends. There, um, there, different countries have different rules around that and the different tax implications and different uh, investors have preferences around that. Um, you know, large dividends can work too as a um, as a different way to return capital, and I'm not totally averse to that. But I, I think I agree that generally uh, buybacks, systematic buybacks that are done over many years, that aren't attempts at market timing, that aren't attempts at um, sort of forcing share prices up to be able to put executive. Uh, a stock option compensation plan, whatever their options into the money, um, you know, genuine substantial share reduction, uh, share count reduction is the most effective way to um, to re-rate stocks. And actually, uh, our mutual friend, our mutual friend uh, Harris Kupperman just put out a blog post about this, about how um, natural resources companies should um, should buy back way more of their stock. And so I think I'm in the uh, copies camp. Yeah, it depends on valuation and the taxes in the country. So um, it, it just depends um, if, whether or not. I mean, if you have a really good business with a lot of free cash flow and high profit margins, you should be doing both. But um, most businesses don't have that type of uh, a good business model that's a uh, high turnover, high sales turnover and high profit margin. For sure. And again, it depends on the specifics. And some companies are really good at, at acquisitions and some are really good at uh, organic uh, growth through exploration. And, you know, some have been very steady dividend payers for many years and just want to keep doing that. Um, I'm not saying that this is true for every company, but I'd say in aggregate, it's it's true across the industry. And then I picked on a few of those larger deals that have been announced recently um, in terms of where where there might be additional value for those buyers rather than doing the deals that they've announced. Well, Josh, I, I've kept you for over an hour. I think we could go on for another hour, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. I want to thank you so much. And definitely for my listeners out there, go and subscribe to Josh's free newsletter, Bison Interest. It's absolutely wonderful with oil and natural gas market research. Also, it's going to be anti-ESG. So if you're an ESG lobbyist, you probably don't want to read it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind words. And you know, we put out we put out some uh, thought leadership that you know it's not all right, but a lot of it's uh, come out pretty well, and uh, hopefully we'll put out some more good stuff uh, soon. Th thank you for having me on. I really appreciate the time.